Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Franklin and I'm with an Epiphany Conversation. Again, I'm Nicole Franklin and Epiphany Conversation. We are eConvo on Twitter and uh, we are here tonight because we heard news last week, in the last couple of weeks, that the Nigerian schoolgirls from Chivak, the 200 girls that were taken um, April 14, 2014, we're going to be returned on uh, Tuesday, the 28th. So that is tomorrow. Um, we're ex extremely doubtful that it's happening, but in anticipation of that, we assembled um, some activists from Nigeria to talk about what's going on, what everyone is doing on the ground, what are they hearing, and what kind of support we can lend. So um, we brought back um, some friends from our human trafficking discussion earlier this year. So um, Victoria is here. Victoria O'Hare, she is actually here in the States uh, doing some work. And uh, we were so happy to meet you, Victoria, from Lagos, and so happy to see you now. Hi. Hi, <laughs> hi Nicole. Hi, everyone. Yes, great to see you. And then she brought on her colleague who was actually there in the region. We are so happy and thrilled to meet Ijiwala. Ijiwala, hello. Yeah, hello, Nicole. Yeah, and hello, everyone. <laughs> cannot wait to hear what you have to tell us. I know you're full of information. Um, Cello Alvarez Steele is a friend in this work and um, doing some amazing work herself, documentarian of the film Sands of Silence, and uh, can't wait to um, talk to her some more as well. She's worked in this field for years uh, in advocacy. And our new friend, Adanma. Hi, Adanma. It's so nice to see you here. Hello, Nicole. Hello, Victoria, Ibrahim, and Cello, and everybody else. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Adanma. Yeah, it's uh, great. <laughs> have our Nigerian friends here and um, you guys just take it away. Um, I don't know much uh, except I do have some news on um, from what the US government is doing that I, I was pretty excited about that I just heard about a half hour ago that I'll relate to you in a bit but you guys take it away. You tell me what's happening because I'm confused and still frustrated. So <laughs> who wants to go first about what the latest is? Okay, um, I it's, it's really a very, very touching situation. Is Nobody ever anticipated it was going to last this long. These girls went away. We are taken away since April 14th. And we had hoped that it would just take like a few days or at worst, you know, a few weeks and they would be brought back. But we have now seen that they've entered the seventh month of their long stay in captivity. And this is... If there's any word much more profound and shocking, I would have used that because this is shocking, this is un unexplainable, this is unacceptable, and this is something that is not just a Nigerian problem anymore because we're talking about the lives of more than 200 young girls. So in the last week, there has been reports about ceasefire and we are seeing a new meaning of ceasefire. Mm. <laughs> new meaning in the sense that ceasefire... Yeah, there are multiple meanings of ceasefire, so they're, they're there. I, 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 I have checked the dictionary to be sure I actually know what that word still means. <laughs> right. Ceasefire is supposed to mean there should be some kind of cessation or violence. We're supposed to experience the law in the violence. We're supposed to see some signs that peace is about to be restored, but instead in the last few days we have even seen like serious, in the, the, the intensity seems to have been scaled up. The abductions have returned even with such brazenness never even seen before. The violence, the, the last, just two days ago, the violence has now, the kidnapping is now, has now in, extended to boys, young boys, less than 10, 13. And I think people are also beginning to lose their sense of outrage. And mm -hmm. um, in the last few days, a lot of abductions have happened. Young women, old women that are reportedly used as human shields. The world, I just, I think the world, even the citizens are just tired of complaining about the same thing over and over again. I think, I, think, I see increasingly people are losing their sense of outrage. And this, shocking news they are beginning to sound so normal and mm. ordinary which is the sad very very sad part which i think we're going to talk some more about tonight 
So that is what has happened the last few weeks. And we just wished the situation was different. Uh, Ajiwala, you're there. And um, and show everybody your T-shirt you were wearing. It was, um, you had to bring back your girl's T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, you can see that. No, yeah, you can see it. <laughs> Could you get up so that we can see it? Can you see it clearly? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Ah, oh, yeah. Now I can see all of it. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. So, yeah, ju just like my sister just mentioned, it's actually unacceptable. It's a situation that we, we we're all complaining. We keep crying daily, especially to us that are with, living within the region here. I live in a state called known as Gombe State, which is one of the states in the region. And uh, as as uh, we all had on the media, everyday parents were hoping and uh, still dreaming and expecting their children coming back home. But the every day we wake up without seeing their faces. And uh, the fear is not just about when are they coming back. The condition that that, that these girls are going to come back is another is an issue today because we don't know for this period of time what condition have they been going through. Uh, like like uh, the fear is like there is no way some some men can take up some girls that are very much mature in, at at such stage and you expect nothing happen to them. It is is actually worrying and disturbing. Well, the, the blame, like we, we, we did enough noise, we made enough noise on the media during our campaigns for the Bring Back Our Girls. Instead of the government doing the right thing, what we saw, it was actually another, th another uh, let's say, another situation that, 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 that demands for maybe another uh, campaign on its own. Because what, what, what I'm saying is, I can remember when when we went out crying, complaining, asking the government to, to, to do something. But at the end of the day, we were seen as another enemies of the government. Mm. We were seen as if we are politicians. We were seen as if we are not, we are even strangers in the country. We are not even citizens of this country. So these are issues that if we are going to sit down here and talk, I think we have so much to say about this. But it is sad, it is very, very sad that the government, from the very day this thing happened to this point, sincerely speaking, the government did not do enough. I mean, they, 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 they are lacking because to us, we expected some kind of uh, action. By now, we thought maybe the girls would be home with their parents, but it's, it's sad. And uh, yeah. It's extremely sad. I just wanted to um, have Adama jump in because Adama, you're here in um, I think the southern region of the United States, what's considered southern. And when you say when you introduce yourself as a Nigerian woman, I'm sure some people um, have a reaction. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm a Nigerian woman, and uh, I was at home when the uh, girls were kidnapped. And just like Ibrahim said, uh, there was a counter campaign, and the government viewed it as an attack on them and a political gimmick. And it, it was so crazy. I, I felt saddened when I started seeing a slow bring back our Jonathan popping up in the media, especially in the social media. I felt insulted on behalf of those girls and their families because that slogan was a slogan designed and targeted at saving the skills. And for you to turn it into politics and say, bring back, bring back our Jonathan from where? Or from what? <laughs> Is he under any duress? Did, was he kidnapped by Boko Haram? Uh, his family uh, not eating and sleeping from worry for him? So th that's one angle of it. Um, they turned it all into politics. Uh, they turned it all into a vicious attack against the government, and that's unacceptable. Now, coming from a public health angle, because I'm a public health activist, I'm concerned about the welfare of the girls, their mental health, when they're eventually, if they're eventually relieved. We hope and pray that that would be the case. But their mental health, I'm not seeing enough action uh, yet towards preparing for these girls coming back. It's not just the physical damage that may have been done, just like Ibrahim uh, mentioned, uh, in our laws in Nigeria, abortion is still illegal. Abortion is still outlawed. Right. So it's illegal for you to 
uh, have an abortion. So what's going to happen to these girls if they come back pregnant? Uh, we, you know, we need to look at these issues that there have to be some policy change, especially in regards to uh, women owning their bodies and being able to take uh, decisions that concern them and concern their own uh, physical and mental health. And so um, I'm concerned that these girls are not going to get enough uh, um, professional help for their uh, mental balance because th they just cannot be the same again. And no one can go through that kind of thing and not yeah. need long psychiatric evaluation and, and help and reach out. And if any of those girls are pregnant, I would strongly recommend as far as uh, it's medically uh, viable that they should have abortion. We don't need this kind of remembrance. Well, we well, 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 also say just responsibly that abortion is also a trauma. So even if it's through rape, Abortion is also a second trauma, so yeah. we'll definitely acknowledge that. Um, but I, I did not know abortion was illegal, and so you're telling me something new there. And this just, like you said, opens up the landscape for this type of behavior, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, this is all quite terrifying, and then I think I got some reports that you guys sent me that there were some um, girls that had been released from a previous incident. Mm -hmm. one, one was pregnant, and we mm -hmm. saw the baby. Yeah, there's a report of uh, but most of these girls. They are, uh, for obvious reasons, their identities are still being um, kept somewhat secret to prevent to prevent them from stigmatization mm -hmm. and other kinds of negative reaction, negative public reactions. But um, it, one of the doctors that came out that examined them did confirm that. The girl, one of the girls that returned that she came back pregnant, she wasn't just pregnant, she was also HIV positive. So that raises the, a, a very serious issue relating to what um, Ada was just talking about a short while ago, that these girls are not going to come back in one piece. And what happens to them when they come back? Apart from trauma evaluation, I think it takes, it is just a lot more than needs to happen for them to really reintegrate themselves back into the society. Mm -hmm. integration, they need to really like have to go through some kind of emotional healing because the emotional scars are not going to go away in the next few days, in the next few years. And, and these are issues that I think the government should be thinking about and not just the government alone. Um, interested stakeholders should be thinking about some, of, some other solutions that can help these girls really come back to normal life. Being away from normal life, being they've been in the forest, or being, nobody knows where they are, but we just assume they're in one forest in, some, in the northern part of the country. Mm -hmm. So it means that they live in a secluded place that has had minimal interaction with people like them, normal people like them. They've not had... Um, had an opportunity to leave. Well, I, I, I just think about um, clothes and hygiene. I mean, <laughs> you know, when you're kidnapped and you don't have a closet full of clothes, you know, and so clothes, hygiene, and again, like you were saying, around people you don't know, it's uh, it's awful, it's disgusting. Yeah, it's just awful. It's just, it, many people are just Im imagining different kinds of things that could have happened to these girls. But being in a, in a forest surrounded by men wielding guns and probably hooded, and some of them, there has been reports of serial rapes. You don't know how many times each, each of the girls get raped in a day. And nobody knows the kind of sexual behavior some of these guys are raping them or so exposed to or indulging. So there are so many issues. And it's just beyond trauma. And yeah. this kind of conversations need to come out openly. Uh, that talked about abortion. Being, ab abortion is a very controversial subject in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it is not just... Abortion is also beyond abortion. There are so many things that need to. We have to start talking about these things openly. Whether or not it's abortion, whether or not it's even stigma, even rape. We need to start like we need to start identifying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, those conversations is is no longer a taboo to talk about sex. Mm -hmm. To talk to children about sex because these children, one way or the other, they also have access to that information. So it is it, not just a policy, because policy, policy is good at in the sense that it can help to reduce social, it can increase social pressure to conform, but there needs to be also social attitudes, mental attitudes that need to change totally so that 
people can allow look at those who have suffered this type of thing differently not necessarily in a negative sense but in a sense that is more accommodating and more understanding um to the plight and the sufferings that they have been through mm -hmm. and then uh, oh, go ahead. Hello. Uh -huh. yeah i have a question do you think uh, do we have time or are you interested in showing the latest uh, human rights watch uh, video that was published a few hours ago uh, and uh, by Time Magazine, or did you get well, that link? Yeah, that the girls are talking about their experiences there. Right, we can post that on the page, and okay. it is okay. haunting, and we'll okay. post that on the page. Um, but um, but definitely, have, thank you for joining okay. that. I have a question also, if we don't see that. I have a question for all the Nigerians. What is the situation? I recently saw this documentary called uh, God Loves Uganda about how. The American, the U.S. Christian right is just basically, you know, dominating the country and changing their perceptions. And of course, they are anti-abortion, etc. Uh, is the Christian right active in Nigeria? Are they bringing these anti-abortion ideas that could cause the situation of the women, the, of the girls, when they escape the Boko Haram? Can we blame this on the Christian movement? Is on the extreme fundamentalist Christian? Not, of I course, not well, it, 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 it is a Christian. Of any Christian organization in Nigeria that uh, openly supports abortion? Uh, I don't think there's anyone uh, out there that does. But yes, abortion is a trauma. But I think um, this girls or any woman for that matter who has gone through sexual violence, extreme sexual violence should reserve the right to decide and choose whether she wants to have uh, uh, she, she wants to have an abortion or not have an abortion. Uh, ultimately, it's the woman's decision, and all we can do is support her and provide her all the resources uh, that she can that can help her to uh, decide on that. So, I will I blame the Christians? Well, I suppose they are practicing their trade uh, or, or the dictates of what uh, Christianity tells them or your whatever religion you practice, what it tells you. So I think that's what they're just following. But like uh, Victoria said, we need to just go beyond the sentimentality and the, uh, you know, the blaming the victim phenomenon. We are very huge of blaming the victim back home. Even if a woman gets raped, we look for a way to blame her. What was she wearing? Why did she go to him? And even in this situation, you'll be shocked that some people, some even institutions, institution, institutionalized. Um, uh, 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 organs would look for a way to blame the victims in, in this case. So th that's something that worries me uh, immensely. Mm -hmm. And also, can I ask um, Ijiwala, um, we were talking earlier about the girls and that trauma and the mental health um, that's needed. So what about, I mean, I my heart broke when um, I heard that 11 parents had passed away, mainly from heartbreak. Some were killed, and um, there could be more of the parents that um, have died since I, that report. What about the community healing that's happening? And Boko Haram recruits young people, right? So what's um, being done in the region to keep the young people occupied and educated and positive? And uh, again, what are we expecting um, from some of the community healing that's happening? It, it must be horrible to walk around day to day. Yeah, yeah, Nicole. This is this is very important uh, angle to the whole situation because if you look at the the genesis of the whole crisis in the first place, has to do with the the negligence that is the neglect from the government. Uh, I can tell you, I came from uh, uh, an environment or let me say a society whereby, uh, let's say, eighty percent of those of those of us that went to school actually have no jobs to do. We we, oh. we don't yeah you wake up in the morning you 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 just have to dump your books and start thinking of how what to do how to do it and where to do it uh, talk more of those that uh, that did not even got the opportunity to to go to school you you wonder if really the government there's a government in place I'm saying this because. Uh, like, like my friends, uh, Victoria there can testify to the way I write on social media. I hit straight to the issues. I don't, I don't, I don't get afraid or scared of anybody. I say it the way it is. 
Now, the true situation is this. Borno, which is my degree, that is Borno State, Yobe, Adamawa, Gombe, then we, ha we have Bauchi. These are the six states, at, including Taraba. These are the six states that are made of the, the northeastern states. And I can tell you almost all the states experience, including even some states across the, the region, experience the attack of the Boko Haram. And you'll be disappointed to know that the, the, the members of the Boko Harams are, some of them, we went to school together with them. And at a oh. point, they decided, yeah, they decided to abandon school. And they, they disappeared. You never get to hear about them again. And uh, it may be along the way, during arrest and all this, and you get to find out that, ah, X, Mr. X is involved. This is the guy you used to know. He was even, you know, you get shocked. You wonder what happened to him. This was somebody that had a dream that you used to, like, sit down together, read books together, and, like, you want to know if maybe you had similar dreams, and by now, where is this supposed to be, and where are you supposed to be? But at the end of the day, you find out this is somebody that was actually planning on how to bomb places and all this is. Now, the worst of it is if you dare talk and mention his name, your whole family will be attacked. Your, the, the whole, you, you dare not say anything about that person. And I can remember this actually almost caused a problem between we the youths in the north and those across this, I mean, the, the, the other side of the country, like the southern part of the country. They were like, we, were, we are the one hiding or supporting or giving uh, or, or giving them the the, 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 the the cover to do whatever they want to. And it was so difficult for us here. We lost even our innocent friends that were working with the security. We lost our innocent friends and brothers, sisters. They are also like uh, trying to help even victims. Because at a point, you, you find out. Victoria can testify this. She went to my degree. She, she talked to people there. She had all the stories. Young people had to leave their homes because once they stay there, if any attack happens, even the military are not going to spare anybody around that area. So the best, every grown-up child within that vicinity has to run away for his life. Because the moment they come in here, there will be no difference between the Boko Haram members and you that is also a victim of their own uh, attack. So coming back to your question, Street, uh, you see the, the, the community actually need to... We, we expected the government given much attention to the communities. That is to say, there should be enough security within the areas. But unfortunately, even the Chibok that we are talking about, where those girls were kidnapped, I can tell you, even then, when, 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 when the, 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 the Bring Back Our Girls campaign was so much uh, intensified, it was exactly at the same time when the, the same community was under attack also, at the same time. So you, you wonder, these are same victims. The parents are crying. Some are falling down, dying, just because of frustration. Some because of fear. Some because of they don't even know what to do. And yet they are being attacked on a daily basis. In fact, villages around were also raided by same Boko Haram. As we're speaking, I can assure you there are six local government areas that are being captured by Boko Haram. There are 25 villages that are being that, that, that are being captured also by Boko Haram. So what are we talking about here? Even with this recent news that we are anticipating the release of these girls by tomorrow or within the, uh, before the end of the week, I can assure you that there are no go areas. Even the military dare not pass through certain places. So if you are telling me there's a ceasefire, good. What kind of ceasefire? Like Victoria was trying to like say, what is the definition of ceasefire here? Now, you, you wonder if with the ceasefire, yet you had, you hearing about bombing, kidnappings, and all those sort of things. The worst of it is there is no arrangement, even from the military. We've been working hard to get to, 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 like get to hear from the military what is happening on the ground, because the media cannot tell you exactly what is happening. They succeeded in taming or sanctioning the media. Yes, please, uh, Chelo. Yeah, I Ibrahim or Ibrahim or Ibrahim. Uh, yeah, I Ibra just got. I don't know if you saw this news. You're right. Yeah, I don't know if you saw this news. The news that came out like uh, six hours ago in CNN. Boko Haram kidnaps 30 in northeast Nigeria. Yes, yes. This 30 week, girls. Yeah, I, I I watched that. It is true. It is in true. Mafa. Mafa. 
So we're saying more, more girls were taken. And then um, I wanted yeah. to also go back on some news. I believe um, one of you had sent me that there was a campaign out of the UK, Safe Schools Initiative, where there was a $20 million fund um, that that came about to protect the schools. Has that happened? Is there any security? Um, you're saying no, Ajiwala. Well, <laughs> you're smiling. Uh, uh, where did that $20 million go and where are our soldiers to protect us? You students? know, I, I just want to say something um, uh, and address Ibrahim on some of the comments he made. Uh, yes, the government, there's a lot of uh, unmet expectations from the government and it's not peculiar to the northern part of Nigeria. It's uh, across Nigeria. And um, the two regions that I know that I've been to that I'm, I would say are the poorest is the Niger Delta that provide the oil and the wealth in the country. Yeah. And the core north, in the, in the Niger Delta, the poverty is as big as it is in the core north. Now, I, I would want to also uh, split the blame between government and community leadership, because the community leadership have not also played a responsible role in uh, 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 taming and showing responsible leadership to their uh, youth and the younger ones. And in many times, in many uh, occasions, they have participated actively in the frustrations of the youth, which has resulted in this out of control uh, spiral. Uh, some of them are the drivers of these uh, problems uh, in their actions or inactions, or even in their dealing their relationships with uh, uh, policy makers, government, or the uh, power players. For instance, the Niger Delta, their relationship with the oil uh, uh, firms, the leadership. Um, it, for the 20 billion naira. Uh, fund for safer schools, I can assure you if we begin to trace it, it will not be a question of, oh, government has done some foul play and all that. There would be some kind of uh, cooperation with community leadership as well, because you really can't do much in the way Nigerian communities are structured, especially if, if down in the grassroots. You really can't do much without uh, community leadership. Most times, most of the things that happen, happen uh, with community leadership, either passively or actively. So I'm, I'm going to split the blame and give some of it to uh, community leadership as well. But the, the North have big leaders and elite group and people who have been leading them and advising them for many years. And I think they could have done a lot more. They could have done more to, uh, to help out uh, and to build the region. And I think they have also failed as much as the government has failed. Uh, um, okay, I, I think I agree with you that this is very, very true. And um, you see, I, I still have to fall back to the idea of uh, is, is, it, is, it, is it the government first or the community first? That is to say, who is in charge? Now, talking about blaming the community leadership, I think the government have the power and the authority to actually point at anybody that is found wanting and to charge him for not doing his job. But because of politi politics generally, I think what we need to do, relating your own point is quite clear, I understood, I, it is very clear. But in our own case here, we are, we are talking about a situation whereby a child is actually getting, I mean, going wayward and the parents are saying, yeah, is the rest, I mean, I, I blame the child, not, not, not the parents. This mm -hmm. is where I have issues with. I don't know if I'm making a point here. Now, yeah, I, in this case... So, so when they first go off into deviance, the children, where were the parents then, is what you're saying? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so because politics has made the government to feel as if I don't want to offend Mr. X because at the end of the day, he might actually... I mean, I might not get his attention, I might not get his vote, I might not get him to be by my side. This is what is happening, because I recently joined politics. If I tell you my disappointment today, you that is working towards the success of whatever kind of pro uh, program or project, you, you they, they look at you as if you're too much of uh, uh, what? You, you, want to, you want to tell them, you want them to leave what they're used to doing. I mean, you're trying to change the ways things are done easily. And at the end of the day, you find out that we're not making headway. So, in essence, I agree with you, uh, my sister, but all the same, I still expect the government to like, okay, it is high time to realize that we cannot continue like this. Something has to be done. 
and it has to be done immediately, especially in a situation whereby the insecurity crisis today is actually consuming lives and consuming wealth, properties and everything. We're losing schools. Now, that, that, that reminds me, the issue of the question you asked, where is the $20 billion being assigned for the security in schools? Mm -hmm. I can tell you, <laughs> sorry to say, whenever there's a kind of grant, even the way this grant get to where it's supposed to. <laughs> I can see Victoria smiling. But that, that, that is to tell you how sometimes it, it depends on if you belong to this XYZ party uh, or the NGO you're running has this connection between XYZ and because you, you are in line with the person's idea and or, or you relate with the person, that is when you get to be shortlisted to even be part of the execution of the project. So I think it's not just the 20, even the budgets, acts about the budgets, acts about everything that has to do with the country, not even the money that is coming from far away. We mm -hmm. need the, the bad well, governments. I, I thought you guys celebrated that you were the richest country in Africa. Wasn't that a, a celebration that happened earlier this year, that, that the money was managed well? <laughs> yeah, yeah Nicole, let me jump in there. Two months ago. Yeah, okay, Nicole. Um, <laughs> the money issue and the richest country issue, in fact, all these are very complex, very complex but distinct issues. Um, let me start with the money, the donation that was made. I think that it was, the timing was wrong. And let me tell you why. Um, there was a safe school initiative. Most, quite a, my understanding of that is that probably is the framing or the presentation, the way it was done, but it looked more like a PR start. You know, um, you are donating money to make schools safer. The environment is still ridden with conflict and violence. The schools are still short. The, most of those territories are still under the control of the terrorists. So I'm just wondering what safe schools mean. If I lived in the region, I would not allow my daughters with 200 girls and more still missing and the security situation you know, deteriorating every day. I'm not likely to leave my girl out of my house, let, allow my girl to step out of the house to go to any school. It's very, very unnatural. It's an, it's an unnatural response. Mm. So with many girls to keep being kidnapped, even as a few hours ago, a lot of organizations are still posting, you know, statistics of girls on boys that have been, you know, taken away from their, even from their parents' homes. So what does this school mean in that context, in a war zone? What does that donation represent? So those are the kind of commitments that are very superficial and are very questionable that happen a lot in terms of interventions. So I don't know how sort, even the people that are making those risks, people that are involved in, in those type of invest, in interventions, either the, the, those that are sponsoring it or those that are thinking about it or those that are implementing it, there is a conceptual disconnect even from the beginning. I'm not sure they're thinking about these things. So mm. that's my reaction to that. Mm. But regarding the drivers of violence, Ada has raised a lot of important issues. I think most of the responses so far have not been looking at the drivers of violence. And that's like the same kind of strategy I see around the world. People try to address symptoms without looking at root causes. So if you are not looking at resolving the trigger factors, to be very frank, if you want to pump 200 billion into the crisis, it's not going to make any difference. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand why uh, Ada gave an, a, made a comparison between Niger Delta communities and northern communities, and two communities that are equally poor, and one is prone to violence and one is not. It means that beyond poverty, the other drivers of violence within the two communities. There are so many poor communities in Nigeria that are equally least, you know, uh, less resourceful and um, poverty is as, as equally as rife. Why are certain communities so prone to violence? Why others are not? This is one question we need to ask. Secondly, Nigeria is a federal government, you know, which means that there are so many questions of federalism that come into play. 
It means that at the end of every month, there is a resource allocation formula that allows every state get a certain contribution from the federal post. Mm. So each state is responsible for managing its own resources. It's not managed by the center. So it means that there's a question of devolution of responsibility and delegation of responsibilities happening at different levels of government. So that is where I agree with Ada that those different layers of government have not been interrogated enough with what they are doing with their own resources, even though there are a lot of un, um, a lot of unmet expectations at the center. Then there's also this third angle that I'm now researching um, researching into currently, which I think is a lacuna in the law. That is why this um, crisis is just festering without any projection of its end inside. The, I have taken a closer look at the terrorism prevention law. We have a terrorism law, 2011. I'm sure probably when that law was conceptualized and framed and passed into law, they never probably thought that they were not able to foresee to get up, you know, to scale up to the current levels that we are witnessing. So that law was not prepared to deal with this, this a violence of this kill. So if you look at the terrorism law, it talks about you know how to, what constitutes terrorism in Nigeria. And I don't quite agree with a lot of things that we are pushed under that definition. It talks about how terror suspects will be caught, how they'll be charged to court. So the real issues that IG Wala is raising regarding what happens to communities caught between the crossfire between Nigeria security forces and the terrorists? What happens to them? What kind of rights do they have? Does that mean, does that crisis extinguish the state's responsibility to protect the citizens in those regions? That law does not answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Then the international law itself is also, there are also some gaps because international terrorism um, is framed within the context of an external force invading another country, you know, and that is not the situation here. So we have what looks like an insurgency in Nigeria, and at the same time looks like terrorism. It's even difficult to characterize a conflict. Okay. So it's difficult to also know the applicable rules that apply. So there are different layers of issues that are not being addressed. So people are just like making donations here and there. That's why um, the, I sent you some of those links in the past week. You know, when you throw money at a problem, you are not solving a problem when you throw money at a problem. You solve a problem by identifying the drivers, the trigger factors of that problem, and taking very concerted steps, very deliberate steps, to address each and every layer of that problem. That is what I think. But, is you know, unfortunately, uh, I've seen, I don't know if any of you have noticed, you, my Nigerian brother and sister, it's, it's a save every time we face a disaster in the country. Some people make money. I mean, we had the Ebola thing. <laughs> we had the Ebola thing. <laughs> millions were again uh, doled out to uh, curtail Ebola. And I really don't see it. I don't uh, know what the money went for. There was no accountability. That is not a Nigerian problem. Everywhere in the world that there's crisis, someone is benefiting from it. Yeah. Whether it's in Syria, in Gaza, in Israel, in Palestine, it's in Iran, horrible. Iran, it's in crisis. It's just horrible that each time we have a problem, each time we have a problem, government will rally around. No, in this case, I'm talking about specifically about government uh, pushing out money every time we have a disaster. And we can't follow the money, really. We're not just able to follow the money and see where it has gone and what, is, what it is doing and what has become of it. There's no justification for the money. So we just have a crisis, just like you're saying, Victoria. We have a crisis and government throws money at it, boom, through one uh, means or one uh, route or the other. And it, the money becomes uh, practically impossible to follow. It just disappears into the ether. That's uh, what I find a bit disturbing. Oh, uh, finance yeah, yeah. manager should be fired. <laughs> there is, there is a... uh -oh. Hello, Nicole. Yeah, go ahead, IG Wallow. Okay, there is a fundamental issue here down in the north that I think we, we must also consider and see how we can address that. Uh, like, if you look at the genesis of Boko Haram itself, you realize that it started from an ideology that was created by an individual. And uh, this individual, nobody cares to know who is, what is his own background, where is he coming from, where did he study, and all sorts of things like that. Nobody cared to know that. And this is very common here in the North. 
an individual will just appear from nowhere, and this, because he mentioned the word God, is, oh, he is preaching about God, and the next thing people come and rally around him, people give him all the attention he needs, they give him everything he needs, before you know he even form a kind of an, an authority within his own cycle, he form a cycle and an authority, and before you know it, this guy will blow and start arguing or, or challenging the authority itself. I think there has to be control over religious, uh, uh, well, I can, I can say private institutions or individuals that form their, their, their own authorities. And uh, coupled with also the control, like I mentioned that, look, money is being thrown for a certain project and nobody talks about it. Where is the money? What happened to the money? Nobody asks questions. I can tell you not just those money, not money specially meant for, for interventions like this, no, generally, even the budget, once you raise, you try, to, you try to raise questions regarding money, they look at you as if you're here antagonizing the government and all that. In fact, to the extent that I remember when we called for protests certain times, I mean, sometimes back, some people within the youths were calling us, were telling us that, look, our religion does not even allow protests. And you wonder, okay, fine, if your religion does not allow protests, does your religion allow stealing? And uh, I mean, you, you don't you don't demand for accountability or transparency. All this is how do you expect us to live together, or how do you expect us to even respect the constituted authorities? So these are the issues. So I think these things are fundamental. NGOs and uh, individuals like us need to do a lot of uh, I mean uh, campaigns in regards to creating awareness, people realizing, understanding their rights, understanding the importance of calling, demanding for accountability, and all these things. If not, I'm telling you, individual will swindle the whole budget and sit down, fly outside the country, spend the whole money, and leave you there battling, trying to complain with hospitals, no drugs, schools, no, 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 no teachers, no books, teachers' welfare, no, nothing. At the end of the day, you find yourself in a market square dancing together with illiterate, semi-illiterate, and even you as a graduate. You don't even know who is who. So these are the situations we find ourselves here. Unless we start to demand for accountability, a single cobble that is meant for XYZ project must be accounted for. And there has to be exactly what it was meant to be. I mean, the value of uh, such money. If not, I'm sorry, we're still, we're still far away. Yeah, well, that, it always comes back to follow the money. That's a good indicator. So like I said, fire the finance minister. But <laughs> So let's wrap up, you guys. Um, I don't think that the release is going to happen this week. Maybe that's just me. But I want to get just a quick um, few notes from everyone on what we are doing. Um, and I want to also thank uh, Chelo and Victoria for saying let's let's chat, let's talk, and let's get out there again and and make some noise. So, um, what are we doing? And uh, we're going to wrap up with that from each of you. I want to give my news in doing. And so I remember that we went and never heard. Um, what happened? You know, no boots on the ground. There was that whole mess, you know, about how we were helping. Well, what did we do to help? Well, there is a one congressperson, Congresswoman Frederica Wilson out of Florida, who is on this mission daily. And um, I would call her more than a hashtagivist, as people have been called <laughs> in the uh, media, as just sitting here as an activist and, and getting on and hashtagging it. She does hashtag. Um, tweet every day with the hashtag join hashtag bring back our girls but she's doing if a swell of us like a ground swell of us get behind her and start tweeting with her every day and she's also on the floor of Congress she she's there and she is so fired up still there is no fatigue that Victoria was mentioning earlier There's no activist fatigue with this woman she is still fighting for the release of these girls. So join Rep Wilson, hashtag bring back our girls. We'll start tweeting as well under eConvo um, and rope her into this conversation so that we can um, get on her bag wagon because that's getting us right into the congressional floor. So very happy right. about that. Yeah. And um, 
Um, who's next? Victoria, just we're wrapping it up and, and just tell us what to do next, your suggestions, especially with Spaces of Change. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at Spaces of Change um, and also as part of a bigger project I'm doing here. I want to do like a legal, a, a very in-depth legal analysis of the crisis because the applicable legal, the framework that even helps to, that applies to this regulation that is governing this type of infraction. There are lots of gaps in the law. So if communities are interested in demanding accountability for these injustices, these legal barriers that they're going to face, there's technically no rule, comprehensive legal framework that's going to deal with these issues. So we're looking at the drivers of the conflict. We're looking at, um, at doing that analysis and helping to really flag out the issues so that different kinds of people that have the capacity to intervene in one way or the other should know exactly what to focus on, not just to throw money at issues. Then, of course, with the campaigning around the girls, around, you know, protection of young girls, around elimination of stigma, around socializing that conversation generally about even taking it beyond the, the Chibo school girls. We need to open up the doors to start that conversation all free, freely about rape, about sexual slavery, about stigma, about pregnancy, about abortion. We need to begin to have these conversations because this crisis is going to have long-term effects on not just these girls, on a lot of girls in, in Nigeria that are either in the region, that are outside of the region, or even the young the perpetrators themselves. So it's a very important issue, and I don't think this is, we are going to leave all of these obligations, we are going to leave all of these responsibilities, trust all of them on the government. All of us citizens have, you know, differentiated roles that we can play, and also, um, as I talked about community leadership, there are also need, and that's also another thing Spaces for Change is interested in doing, engaging the community leadership, particularly in those volatile areas, to begin to have those conversations, to begin to open up people's minds, to begin to challenge those structures that promote fundamentalism. Excellent. And yeah, I think having the conversation will empower the women in the area too, especially if we can freely talk about sex and reproductive health there and um, prevention of atrocity. So IG Walla, you're next. What is your wrap up? What do yeah. you want to do? What are our instructions? Yeah, mine is uh, the fact that I live in the northern part of the country where this crisis is happening. I think uh, mine has to do with the, 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 the leadership within the community as well, just like she mentioned. But particularly, I, I want to concentrate more on the politicians, or I want to call on the politicians to realize the implication of their, their attitude, because the politicians never bother about the situations on the ground. What matters to them is once they can drive safe to in, within within these communities and get to their destinations, they don't care. What they normally do, they throw monies around, and the boys, like, like the, those, those political talks, they get carried away trying to pick the money, and before you know, they zoom out of the situation, I mean the environment, and they feel safe, and that is all. They never come back to now say, oh, if we allow these boys to continue this way, these are very good recruits for the terrorist or insurgency, whatever. But we, we, I feel we should take it to the state assemblies, to the national assembly. We should bring out, every individual must come back home and even account for his own actions. We must also demand for their own, what, uh, in fact, let, uh, let them tell us what they do within their own communities, with their lives, with their family, so that we see how it applies to the communities also before they can even be voted into the offices. Else, we, still, we have a serious work to do. But like Victoria said, I'm going to also pay attention to call on NGOs or individuals and groups to please pay attention to the politicians because they are actually the, 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 the drivers of this crisis in my own case. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Ajiwala, for joining in so late from um, Nigeria. We so appreciate it. Chelo, um, our resident instigator here against um, sexual slavery, what are we to do? Well, exactly. I mean, for me, it's more a question maybe for next uh, time. What can we do in the U.S. to support the efforts in a way that is not perceived like uh, we are patronizing, we are uh, applying our imperialist attitude in, in Africa, on the contrary. What can we do as, as colleagues, brothers and sisters, activists, 
we want to bring awareness on this. And because the the announcement of the 30 children uh, abducted this weekend in, in Nigeria again, there were boys and girls. So this brings the issue of what's happening with the child soldiers. I mean, I'm a sex um, a slavery activist, but I'm very concerned with the boys' child soldiers and girls' child soldiers. We also have to, to look at into that, into all the kids and all the young kids that are being recruited by the Boko Haram and are converted and made into terrorists, and now they're terrorizing the, the girls and the nation and themselves. So there has to be like a two-pronged approach, I think, to both boys and girls and, and just taking care of their matters for next conversation, I guess. For sure. Thank you so much, Taylor. And uh, Adama, I'm so happy you joined us tonight. We have so much to talk about with public health. That's an issue all in itself. <laughs> but yes, what, what are we to do next? Well, um, it, it's interesting. It would have been interesting if uh, to see how the United States would be reacting if Hillary Clinton was still the Secretary of State because, you know, she's huge on women issues and uh, those are women. So that would have been an interesting scenario to consider. But yeah. I think we should redefine how we look at uh, uh, terrorism and it should become a more international and a more involving problem. It, it, outside the case of Ebola, Ebola got out of hand because it was just not anybody's business until it spread out. And if we had done something early, would have been able to stop it before it became the global issue that it became. So in, in that case, we, we need to really redefine this thing. The United Nations came up because we said never again after the Second World War and the crimes and atrocities that happened. Yet something similar happened in Rwanda. We all stood by, did nothing until it got really, really out of hand and then we started chasing our tails round and round. So we should redefine these things and terrorism should just become terrorism. If people are killing, whether they are citizens of the country or they're from outside, they are killing people in large droves in any country and the country does not seem to be able to put an end to it. The world should be able to come together and intervene and put a stop to it. At this point, I'm not sure if anything short of brute force can uh, combat this uh, Boko Haram issue. Uh, I'm not too sure if I'm going to allow Ibrahim, I'm just meeting you, but I think I love you enough to not let you go and stand in, on the streets of Gombe and start preaching uh, against these people, you'll probably end up dead to, by tomorrow morning. I don't think you have the capacity. I don't think we have the capacity at this point to do too much. I think it's just matching force, matching brute force that can put an end to this and then we clean up, just like what happened in Rwanda because what is happening now is not too different. Uh, from what happened in Rwanda. We are scaling up. It's just starting small and it's going to keep scaling up as we've seen uh, over the years. So we need to take a bigger look at the uh, whole issue of terrorism. We need to become a bigger community. So the U.S. could also lead the push because the, the U.S. seems to be a global leader and pushes a lot of uh, things, especially in the United Nations. They could also lead the push and the United Nations can sit together and look at how terrorism is defined and at what point uh, nations can no longer stand by and, and look so that we don't have, a, 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 so that we keep to the never again uh, agreements that gave birth to the United Nations because at this time if we're standing by and children are going missing, women are getting killed, people are getting killed and nobody cares and nobody's doing anything and you're playing diplomacy and politics, the loser, uh, the people down there in the community and eventually the entire world is going to share in, in the trauma and, and the evil uh, that is going to keep spreading. That, that's what I think. Agreed. Um, thank you again to my amazing panel. Thank you so much. We're going to have a lot of links on um, right below here in the YouTube information that you guys can continue to support and spread the word and contact um, our panelists and their NGOs um, and their activism. And yes, stay safe, please, Ijiwala. We want to <laughs> see you um, in the future. And to all of you, thank you so much. And thanks, everybody. Um, we will talk soon. And stay with us on eConvo and keep following um, our progress um, here that we're hoping for the best. All right, thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Nicole. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.